Hi, it's Alistair, it's Electric Scotland. It's been quite some time since I've done a, a, a video and I thought maybe I should uh, maybe do one again just to get things uh, going. Um, in particular, I, I just wanted to cover this uh, coronavirus that we've got going. It's just that I, I'm, I'm keep reading and watching news stories about it all the time because it's obviously in the news daily. Uh, it's just I feel at the end of the day, you know, the governments uh, are, are being hauled over the coals by almost everyone by what they've done wrong rather than what they've done right or anything. You know, at the end of the day, I think most governments have done a very good job. I mean, like Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, they get criticised for not locking things down faster. But honestly, when you think of it, who wants to close down an economy and accept huge increases in debt because of it? I mean, anyone with any sense would hesitate to do anything. And so I, I guess that's where I'm, I'm coming from, is that the debt we've already generated due to this coronavirus episode is, is horrendous. It really is. And it's going to take years to pay this off. And that's you and me, you know. I mean, at the end of the day, we need to pay it off. And also, at the end of the day, we seem to be blaming the governments and not blaming ourselves. You know, at the end of the day, I think we need to take personal responsibility for this. You know, we've got very clear... I mean, everyone says it's not clear about what to do, but I mean, it is clear. One thing it says is self-distancing. Six feet apart, please. So if you do that, the other thing is wash your hands frequently. And the other part is wearing a mask. Now, I mean, wearing a mask, you don't need to wear it all the time, but if you're going out and about and going shopping, then as a courtesy at least, you should wear a mask when going shopping. But if you're going to any place where self-distancing is not possible, then wearing a mask is the only sensible thing to do. Simple as that. I, I mean, you must keep seeing all these demonstrations going on where people are not wearing masks. I mean, some are wearing masks, but a lot aren't. And they're within six feet of others. So there's a very good chance they're going to get it. We're returning to schools and returning to universities now. And the young ones really haven't got much common sense these days. And they don't think anything can happen to them. But one of the things we've learned is that you can have the virus, but not actually experience much in the way of symptoms. I mean, even less than a common cold in many instances. So that means that, you know, you could be passing on without realizing you're actually infected. And so if you follow these basic rules that we've got, self-distancing and wearing a mask and so forth, you can prevent yourself spreading that virus to other people unbeknowingly. I mean, one thing I think the governments need to take responsibility for is getting an accurate test. Because too many reports are coming out that people got tested, found to be infected, but end up that they weren't. And other people saying you're not infected, when in fact they were infected. So we need to get much better and higher quality tests. That's on the government. And the other thing is that we need to get whatever tests we get, we need the results fast. I mean, within half an hour it would be excellent. That means that when you get tested, you hang around for half an hour, you'll get the results. So you'll know when you leave. But there's no point in getting a fast result if the test itself is not accurate. That's where I think the government comes into play, plus ensuring that they, we've got enough of the medical stuff that we need for hospitals and, and care homes and so forth. But otherwise, I, I think most governments have done well. Some countries seem to do better in keeping people alive, like the death rate in some countries is way down on what 
other countries are experiencing. So where that's happening, again, the government has to take responsibility there to find out how they're being so successful and why we aren't, and then do something to fix the issues. So these are the areas that the government should be involved in. But frankly, I think they've got to the point where I don't think there's any more money to spare, really, on giving people furloughs and stuff like that. I think we just have to accept the fact that uh, a lot of us are going to have problems. Now, it's okay for me to speak because I, I suppose I'm one of those that's on a pension and therefore less affected. But I'm not, to, not unaffected because clearly in this day and age, prices are going up. And so I'm on a fixed income and therefore I'm hit when anything like that happens. So, I mean, e even though I'm a bit isolated because of the pension cessation, I'm certainly not unaffected by it. So my, my simple plea is to, to start ignoring most of the media, because most of the media are biased. I mean, anyone with any common sense knows the media is totally biased. And, and the writing from biased political standpoints as well. Ignore all of that rubbish. Get to the facts. And the facts are self-distance distancing is the best way to avoid it. And self-distancing is better done, obviously, uh, you have more of an issue inside than outside. So if you're going to have an event at all, try and have it outside. Uh, so, I mean, that's self-distancing. Then the other thing is about wearing a mask. You wear a mask where you can't self-distance, basically. Like when you go shopping, as a courtesy to the staff in the shops, you should wear a mask. And when you wear a mask, your mouth and nose have to be covered, not just your mouth, as some people seem to think. And the other thing is you wear a mask where you cannot self-distance. I mean, if you're going to work and you can't self-distance in work, but you need to work, then wear a mask. You know, like, there's still too many events on where lots of people are crowding in together. If you're crowding in together, wear a mask. End of story. I mean, these are the basic things you can do to help yourself. And then if your neighbour or local business or something like that is, is, is disobeying those basic safety rules, report them. I mean, I often say send them to Coventry. That's a, I mean, I don't know whether non-British people know it, but when you were sent to Coventry, that meant people wouldn't talk to you. If you talked to them, they would just ignore you as if you weren't there. They would shun you, basically. And that was quite uh, difficult for a lot of people to cope with, and so they quickly sorted themselves out, so they could get back into normal social graces again. And, and frankly, if someone, if your neighbour is having great parties around the place and lots more people are coming up than should be, report them. I mean, what you're doing is supporting all of us. You're not being nasty about it, you're being kind. And how many of those people, I mean, are your neighbours actually getting infected because of all the people that your kids have invited around? You know, you need to think about those things, basically. As I say, I think the core for, for, for governments is that they must get accurate testing. That's the first thing. Then that testing must, must get the results of the testing as fast as humanly possible. And if you can get it within half an hour of being tested, that's great. Then at least we can trust the test and we can trust the results and we'll get them right away. That's crucially important. I think after that, the government should be making sure that there are enough masks around and ventilating machines or whatever for the hospitals to get hold of and keep our care people and frontline workers safe. That's crucially important. And then in addition to that, they should be also helping to encourage companies to seek new vaccines to get rid of this coronavirus. So 
these are the things that government can do that we personally can't do. But to expect the government to do everything, uh, it's ridiculous. So, that, I think it's a clear role for the government, but I think it's a very clear role for all of us, all of us individually, to step up to the plate. Okay, so anyway, that's that. Then, on to uh, politics. I mean, we've still got the Brexit situation and we've got obviously the elections coming up in America. But Brexit is getting a bit politicised in America as well because the Democrats don't like uh, Britain becoming an independent country again and they're basically threatening to, to, to get rid of any free trade deals that we might have had with them because Biden and um, what's her name, Pelosi, um, the Democrat Party is saying that they won't, uh, if we don't accept the EU's dominance over us, then they won't do a trade deal with us. Well, frankly, we don't need America. And frankly, I think we could do very well without America if we had to. But there's no way am I accepting Biden and the Democrats say so that they won't do a deal because we want to become an independent country again. End the story. You know, I mean, it's like America's told, well, you've got to kowtow to China now, you know. I mean, that's what Biden's doing. He's asking China for help. And if he gets the help from China that he's looking for, that means he's going to kowtow to China in the future. I don't think most Americans would want that, but maybe they do. I don't know. But certainly in the UK, we want out of the EU. We don't want the EU to have anything to do with us anymore as far as any government or laws are concerned. Yes, we'd like a free trade deal, we can't get one, so what? We'll deal under WTO terms. But no way accepting, after we leave at the end of the year, no way are we accepting the EU's dominance over us as far as laws are concerned. End the story. So that Democrats can go lump it as far as I'm concerned. Anyway. Now, as I say, the um, state of American politics, bad. It's always been very divided. There's a lot of reports on, no matter the results of the election, there could well be big lawsuits and everything going on. Whether that's going to happen, I don't know. But certainly I've been looking at the spectators' view of the US elections. And in my view, they've given the best reports of any organization as far as between Trump and Biden and everything concerned. I think they're more realistic and, and, and honest in their appraisals. Um, these are just new. You can see them on YouTube, by the way, and the, the reports on, on what the election is doing in America. But the spectator is apparently announcing that they're going to launch the, the GB news channel early next year. And that's going to be directly against the BBC and Sky News. And frankly, when I've been watching the report, I think it's about the most unbiased channel I've seen in a long time. I mean, the BBC is so biased it isn't true. And they keep denying it. But they're, they're total liars. I mean, you can't trust the BBC on any major political issue. Like Brexit, they're anti-Brexit. Totally, throughout the whole organisation, they're anti-Brexit. People should be fired from a lot of these journalist spots. And we should bring in new people altogether. It's the only way the BBC is going to survive. And I think there's a lot of knives out for them now. I think you're going to see the BBC going down there. I mean, they do certain things very well, always have done. But when it comes to news, they're biased. Can't trust them. So don't look to the BBC for honest assessments of presidential elections or Brexit or anything else. They're biased. End of story. Not trustworthy. But as I say, same with the other, the, the other television media in, in, in the States is totally left-wing. And therefore you can't trust them, really. I mean, you can't trust anyone that's obviously biased. And so it's, it's, it's hard to find honest brokers in the middle of all this. I'm finding a few blogs that I'm watching more because I kind of trust the blogs. It's like for Scotland's finances, I always go to Kevin Haig and his chocker blog. To me, that guy's accurate, can substantiate anything he says, 
uh, and I totally and utterly believe him, trust him totally when he talks about Scotland's finances. He's not predicting anything, he's merely stating facts when he goes through what they're telling us. And what they're telling us is what happened basically last year, because obviously they have to take time to get the statistics out. But I totally trust him. Uh, and I'm gradually finding other sources that I find, and I will at some point put up a little page on the site to give you my own trusted resources. I mean, for example, I was watching the Daily Express, uh, .co uk, for example, and they're clearly very biased for Brexit and very anti-SNP, but when you actually read the articles, uh, frankly, the headline means nothing to the actual article. The actual article often has nothing to do with the headline they put up. So, you know, they are very biased and you'd only want to watch them if you were pro-Brexit and anti-SNP, to be honest. But even then, I mean, they're not credible, I don't think, in a lot of the report. So it's both ways, I say it. Okay, I've just finished my newsletter and I actually have done a bit of a write-up on my that has got the notes bit or news bit about the coronavirus. And I've also given you a, a, a listing at the top, which is um, basically the enhanced relations with India should be a top trade priority for post Brexit Britain. Uh, bearing in mind that if we at least leave without a deal, then we can go full steam ahead in dealing with the world as a, as a country. And I think, frankly, that would be good. I also see one of our British people is in with a chance of getting the new chairmanship of the WTO. And frankly, looking at the opposition to him, he would be far better than anyone because he'd have credibility. The other ones are from minor countries around the world and frankly have no credible background at all. But so if he was voted in, I think that would be great for the world, world trade. But anyway, um, that's the two news items I gave you. I've been doing quite a wee bit of updates uh, around the place. Um, and in, in the news that I bring you, uh, I will say there's, um, there's one uh, that, that you might like to do. It's the cat who hitched a lift on a worldwide tour. It says when former Edinburgh rugby player Dean Nicholson packed his job in to travel the world, he hoped it would be a life-changing experience. And it was when he met this wee cat on his world tour. And his cat kind of took over his life a bit. Very charming story, that. And it's something nice to read in amongst of all the doom, gloom and everything that's going on at the moment. Um, there's also a bit of a problem with the SNP, with the Alex Salmon inquiry. Uh, basically, the uh, convener, which is Linda Fabiani, of the inquiry says that um, it's been completely frustrated by the lack of evidence being handed over. <coughs> <coughs> and uh, apparently Ruth Davison, who's the he current head of the Conservatives in, in the Parliament, Holyrood Parliament, apparently cracked up laughing at Nicola Sturgeon's attempts of getting around the, 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 the problem that they're, they're having at the moment. So it's quite amusing. So I thought I'd highlight that to you. Okay, so uh, that's really all I wanted to say. I just felt I had to say something about this coronavirus because there's just so much rubbish being talked about it. And I think we have to understand, we have to take responsibility ourselves personally for this. We can't rely on the government uh, to do everything for us. So anyway, there you go. That's just a wee short one, but... Uh, you know, I'm still around and still alive. How much longer, I don't know, but I'm still alive today anyway. Okay, hope you have a, a great time and uh, stay safe. Thanks for listening.